Are we all ready to give praise and love to our God? I can't hear you. Woo! Let's all stand up and let's make it all about Jesus today. Amen? Amen. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Lord of all loves. Amen? We cannot outlove Jesus. So, Father, we thank you this morning that you are good and you are great and you love us all. We love you because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, we give you glory. Amen. Are you ready, church?
Let's do team little copper hands. Come on, one. Sing blessing and honor. Sing blessing and honor. Glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Blessing and honor, blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days.
Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Do you feel the love of the Lord here Amen. this morning? Amen. Wow. Last night we had a wonderful time. I was here with them in the first part for the food. <laughs> and the couples were here. And I understand that many of them fell in love again. <laughs> Praise God. That's good. You know, when the Bible says we love because he first loved us. And when you love our Lord Jesus, his love will spread. His love will affect us 
in our relationship with one another. And you love your husband, your children, even more than ever before. I just want to thank God for Karen and Ida and Elvick and the different ones who, who sorry? Alex and uh, Venus and all the different ones who work so hard to make it possible. They're really asking me, when are we going to do the next one? Well, we're, we're looking at it. I, I asked Sharon to take a look at some of the uh, evening cruises uh, in, you know, around the, uh, um, the city of Vancouver. And uh, maybe we'll do that uh, in a few months and uh, take a cruise and uh, have a dinner and uh, a dance on the ship. How about that? Would that sound good? We did that years ago. And, you know, we want to do a lot more of that to just, uh, again, bring people together um, and then draw others in as a result. Because this is a community of love. God loved us so much, and, and, and we want to be able to spread that love. And we also want to do more with our young people and the young adults. And we also want to thank those who contributed so much time and their money to paint. Uh, you know, you realize that's a fresh coat of paint, and uh, it's so much brighter here. So uh, if you're here this morning and you're the ones who help us to paint and contribute, can you stand? I want to honor you, those of you who are here. Pastor, are they here this morning? No, they're not here this morning. Just, you know, when you see them, just thank them. And uh, they're putting so much work. Praise God. And so appreciate all of you. Praise God. Let's just bow our heads in prayer as we go to the Word of God this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you so much, oh God, that you are here in a special way. And we feel your presence. We feel your love. And we ask you, oh God, to help us to even love one another more, and, and through our love, the world will know that you are our God, and that you're here to bless us. And so, bless the word, bless our hearts, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. We, we, we continue in our series in the book of um, First and Second Corinthians, and I want to talk about preparing for a rebuild. Um, I know in Vancouver, there are a couple of uh, families that rebuilt their homes, and uh, one of them, you know, powerful testimony, uh, someone paid for them to rebuild, to knock down their old house, and this person paid for them to rebuild the house they're living in. I mean, like, imagine that, uh, and all for free. And so, you know, powerful testimony of how God can provide. But, you know, rebuilds are not exactly easy, but it's worth a while because you get, you knock down your old house, and then you get a new house, right? And that's where people like to renovate because they want to turn their old into new. And they want to have a, a greater purpose, a greater place, a, a better place. And, and when God saved us, you know, He didn't just save us so that one day we can get to heaven, but He saved us and He ba began a work of rebuilding in your lives. He wants to change, He wants to change us so that we become a better person, but much more than that, so that we become just like Jesus, like Himself. In um God needs to break down walls. You know, in rebuilds, you have to break down before you can build up. And in our lives, part of that rebuilding is breaking down walls that prevent a spiritual breakthrough. You know, and I'm praying for spiritual breakthroughs all over. I know that different ones have been experiencing the blessings of God in a special way. But each one of us needs a spiritual breakthrough so that in every aspect of our lives, in our marriage, in our family life, in our work life, and in our church, experience together in service that we see a greater outpouring of God's love and his blessings. And God promised Jeremiah and the nation of Israel, he says, see, I've set before you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build, to plant. But you see, the thing about rebuilds, the thing about God changing us, the thing about life itself is that life is stressful. And rebuilds are stressful. And that's my first main point this morning. Uh, you know, every single one of us at some point and at many points in our life, we feel the stress, the pressure of life. And Paul wrote to the church, and Paul reminds us this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed. In other words, he wants to give us information. He wants to tell us what and why we're going through the situation in this life. And he talks about himself as an example. He says, we were under great pressure, great pressure, stress, far beyond our ability to endure. And sometimes it feels that way, the stress in life that comes. 
you know, whether it be work and then pile on that family, pile on that the financial strain, all the different pressures of life. It says, Paul says, we were under great pressure. Men of God, men of miracles, he felt the pressure. He says, it was far beyond even his ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. That's how bad it was. That's how great the pressure was. And so it can be stressful, and life will be stressful. But I want to add this one thing, that blessed are you when you are stressed. That the Bible talks about that. You are blessed if you are stressed. So if you're stressed, don't think that, you know, oh, you know, stress is, is from the enemy. Stress is, is because I'm sinning or whatever. Yeah, it could be that, but stress is allowed by God. It's part of life. And let me share with us why. Stress comes in different forms. Stress comes in persecution, but also in suffering, in pain. And blessed are the stress. Rebukes can be stressful. God changing us can be stressful. God transforming us and using us can be stressful. But let me say this, like a house that you knock down and you rebuild it, the completed work is rewarding. You want that. We need that. And stress is part of that suffering in life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul talks about it and again, and that same word again in the Greek comes out, that great pressure. He says, but we have this treasure, the Holy Spirit, in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed same word again great pressure hard pressed under pressure on every side but he adds something he says we are pressured we are stressed we are burdened something is pressing us down yet we are not crushed in second Corinthians chapter one he says we are under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure and that's the thing you know when you're stressed you feel like I can't handle this. I can't handle this stress. I want to give up. And, and, and you know, for many people, because of mental health issues, because of stress, they, they can't cope. They have no one to turn to. They become suicidal. But we, we are not in the same position. Paul says, we are hard pressed. We are under great pressure, yet not crushed. Let me explain. You see, the Greek word really has two applications. There are two kinds of stresses, two kinds of pressures in life that we need to understand. With God, the pressure is different, the stress is different. Yes, it is beyond our human ability, but yet, with God, we are not crushed. We are not perplexed. We are not in despair. We are not, not in destroyed. You see, the first kind of stress is what happened yesterday in Ukraine. First kind of pressure that comes down. In Ukraine, there's a constant bombing. And yesterday, the Russians uh, started a new offensive in Donetsk, in the eastern part of Ukraine. And uh, so down a narrow road, they sent 31 tanks, you know, armored tanks and arm armored personal carriers down this road. But they didn't know that the Ukrainians were ready for them with their handheld portable anti-tank weapons that the uh, Western world has supplied to them. One simple device like that can blow up a tank. And so they know the tactics today like we were trained. You know, we, we don't fire on every tank. We fire on the first tank. We cripple it, we fire on the last tank, we cripple it, and the rest are trapped in between. And uh, what happened, you know, in the news this morning, I was reading it at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, 31 tanks, all in one row. When the first one was destroyed, the rest started to get panicky. And the thing about tank warfare is this, I train in the military, we train with armored personnel carriers and tanks, and we're always afraid. Those things can roll over us. Tanks are designed to go forward. Because the person, the gunner sits there, the driver, he sits and he uses a periscope and he can only see in the front. He cannot see behind him. You know, uh, the latest American tank, they have, uh, you know, uh, special devices, electronic devices that can see all around. But most tanks can only look forward and you can drive forward and backwards, but you're trained, you only go forward. The reason being, when you go to war, the tank goes in front of you and the infantry men hide behind the tank. So as the tank clears the barriers, the, you know, whatever uh, structures, foundations, then the infantry come out from behind. In case they have a handheld device to shoot, destroy your tank, you shoot them. That's how it works, you know, you support one another. 
So you're supposed to go forward and we follow behind. But when the first tank got hit, they panicked, they started backing up. Imagine what happens when the tanks start backing up. Your troops are behind. And so the tanks started crushing, pressing under them. Their own soldiers, and they say that so many of their own Russian soldiers were flattened. And let me tell you this, it's not a very nice sight when a person is flattened. I've seen a, a, a motorcyclist, you know, on the highway that was flattened by a semi-truck. Literally, they covered with him with a cloth and it was only so thick. The cloth came up only so high on the road as we were passing. So all these soldiers were crushed by their own tanks. That's the first kind of pressure. The enemy comes, he sends him to destroy us, to flatten us and destroy us, like the tanks that flatten their own troops. But the second kind of pressure is different. You know, some of you are uh, working perhaps in the industry where they produce things. Uh, lately, they have a lot of uh, plastic things that they, they produce. You know, I thank God for all the different ones that have been um, blessing us with meals. And they, you know, we have uh, all the different uh, uh, apps that you can order food. And it comes in packages. You know, those plastic pa packages are made under what they call injection pressure molding. So they inject a plastic in, and then it goes into a mold, and then it flattens, and the pressure causes it to be pressed onto a mold. And then out comes your plate, or your cover, or whatever plastic. And that's the second kind of pressure that God uh, allows us to go through. God is putting pressure on us to mold us to his image. He applies the heat in our life, but he molds us. And that's why God allows us to be stressed and pressured, so that we are molded into his image. And, uh, you know, the same kind of thing that Jesus went through in Gethsemane. You know, uh, Gethsemane uh, means the pressing of the grapes to produce uh, the Holy Spirit in our life and the joy that comes out. So stress is part of that suffering. You know, blessed are the stress because stress is part of the suffering because God is molding us. He's not destroying us. Paul said it. We are hard-pressed. We are molded, yet not crushed, yet not destroyed, not forsaken, not struck down, not destroyed. So let me say this. You know, if God allows the stress and the pressure in your life, it is so that you will be molded, so that you will go to Him, you will allow Him to mold you. I've gone through a lot in my life. And part of that has produced a lot of the qualities of Christ that, that I enjoy today in my life. So stress is part of the suffering. God uses suffering to get our attention. That's the second thing why God allows stress and suffering. God created our bodies. He designed them to send us messages. Uh, some of you went to see doctors recently and found out that you have issues because there's a pain. You know, the first sign that I had colon cancer was... I had a tiny little bit of pain on the left bottom side. Then I thought, hmm, this is funny, this is unusual, I never had that pain before. You know, and, and so I, I, I arranged for myself to have the colonoscopy. You know, and pain it gets our attention. Pain, God uses it to send a message to us that you need to go see the specialist. You need to go to God and find out something is not right. C.S. Lewis, in one of his books, he said that pain is God's megaphone. You know, today we have a sound system. Back then, it's just a megaphone, you know, just to make it loud. Some of us are hard of hearing, so God has to use a megaphone to shout. Some of us are hard of hearing, so that God has to allow us to go through pain. And, uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 4, it says, Therefore, do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. You know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying that, yes, you're going to suffer in the body. Yes, you're going to feel pain. Because God will allow that so that we will turn to Him. So that we, we, He will get our attention so that we will work on something that is more than just flesh. Too often we just feed this flesh, we care for this flesh, but then God allows this flesh to break down. Eventually this flesh is going to die. It's going to corrode, it's going to rot. God wants us to focus on something. He says, I allow pain on the outside so that you begin to deal with the inside, your heart, your spirit, your soul. And so he says, though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward is being renewed 
For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look to the things which are seen, but all the things which are not seen. See, we don't look at the things inside our heart because we don't see it. We don't see the condition of our hearts. We only feel the pain of our outside, you know. And that's why God allows, as you age, some people say, why did God allow all these pains and aches and, and, and disease when we are older? Well, he's reminding us, your time is drawing near. He wants to get our attention. You've got to work on the inside now because your are outside. The pain is telling you, the aging, the aches and pains is telling you your time is coming up soon. So God is merciful to us. He's trying to get our attention. And, and so God uses suffering too. Another third aspect is to draw us to himself. To draw us to himself. Because there are so many things in this world that draw us away from God. Time again, Israel, you know, because whenever God blessed them, they just get drawn away. In 2 Chronicles 15, 4, it says, But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the Lord of Israel, and they sought him. It's a different kind of stress. Their distress. God is dissing them by giving them stress so that they will know that, hey, you know, you've forgotten God. You know, you, you have been drawn away into the world. You know, an interesting thing about human beings is this, that we need to be taught a lot of things. But do you know that if you study the Bible and you study uh, human behavior, no one needs to teach us how to make idols. We know how to make idols. We know how to create idols. Even Israel, when God did all the miracles, Moses took them to, through, the, through the Red Sea and all the plagues and every miracle. You know, they were close to God at that point. But the moment they were free, the moment they could enjoy their life, and the first moment they didn't see Moses because he went up to the mountain to get the law from the Lord. The moment they did that, they said, make us an idol. I mean, how, how did they even come up with the idea that we need to have an idol? You know, and likewise, for many of us, our idol may not be religious, it may not be like a cow, but our idols are a lot of these things, even the good things in life, that draw us away from God. And parents, I want to encourage you and challenge you. You know, when you have kids, there are so many things in this life that draws our children away. You know, because this is the good life in Canada. Uh, soccer, hockey. Then when their kids grow up, they meet other kids. They're like, oh, I'm playing in a hockey league. I'm in this club. I'm in this, you know, soccer. And most of these things happen on a Sunday morning. And so they stop going to church. Do, do you know today, what, what is this Sunday? Anyone? Wow, how come you know it's Super Bowl? Of course, right? In North America, everybody knows it's Super Bowl Sunday. Do you know that today is the lowest attending, attendance day throughout the year in America? Because most people don't even bother to come to a Sunday morning service. You know, they just stay at home. They just prepare everything. You know, they go and celebrate and, and, and get ready and, and enjoy themselves. And the attendance is the lowest ever, you know. And, you know, that it's not sin to enjoy sports, but then it becomes an idol when it draws you away from God and your focus. And so God sometimes allows suffering so that we realize, hey, you know, it's important. And of course, Jonah, when, 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 he, when God was speaking to him, when he's doing his thing, and when everything was fine, he just didn't bother to listen to God. He just, you know, God told him to go to Nineveh. He went the opposite direction. Instead of drawing close to God, staying close to God, he went far away from the will of God, from the presence of God. And then God had to send a whale. God had to send a, a whale to swallow him. And, and he basically, in Jonah 2, verse 2, he says, In my distress, the same word again, in my distress. I called to the Lord, and he answered me. You know, why, why does it, you know, have to be that we have to move away from God before he has to allow things like that to happen? But God uses suffering to draw us to himself. A fourth reason is God uses suffering to discipline us. Um, in Hebrews 12, verse 5, he says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart while he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. Let me say this. God doesn't discipline you because He hates you. God doesn't discipline you because you are not His best son. The more He disciplines you, the more He loves you. I tell you, I went through so much discipline in my life. If you spend 13 years in the military, you will know what discipline is. I mean, the time you have to wake up, 
you know, that my time is not my own time because when you're in the military, any moment, any time, any day, they can call you up. You know, through the television, uh, through the news, through internet, they have done it so well that when they, they have a, what they call a recall process, we have exercises all the time, you're watching the cinema and all of a sudden you see a soldier signal come on, an icon of a soldier and it's flashing. And then it flashes a certain number, which is your unit. It's a code. And it tells you, you've got to report back to base. So if you are a certain level, you've got to report back within an hour. If you are in the reserves, in other words, you have already served your, your national service for two and a half years, now you're in civilian life, you have to report back within 24 hours and get ready for war. You know, and, and your time is not your own. If you don't, you get discipline. I mean, you talk about discipline, but God put me through a lot of discipline. And, and the reason was, you know, through, through the years I realized it's because He loves me so much. So much so that in my life I've been so blessed because of all the discipline that God has put me through. Because discipline is corrective. It corrects you. It makes you more like Jesus. It is remedial. It's not revengeful. God doesn't hate you. He wants to make you like Himself. He disciplines us for our good. And the fifth reason is God uses suffering to strengthen our faith. He wants to stretch us. 1 Peter 1.7 says, These trials or sufferings have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. You know, if you don't use your muscles, your muscles will atrophy really quickly. Uh, Sister Kim, you know, she's not with me because uh, she's just learning how to use crutches right now. And uh, she just went through a knee replacement surgery. Uh, they just took out the staples and her, her cut is so big. Um, so now, ever since the first day, she has to stretch out her legs straight and then she has to bend it at least more than 90 degrees right now for the first two weeks. She has to achieve 90 degrees. And let me tell you, because your muscles have not been used and it's been cut and now you have to exercise and stretch the ligaments and the muscles, even though with the pill, when she's doing the exercise, she's like screaming. She's like, ouch, it's so painful. But if she doesn't do it, her, her muscles will be useless. Her legs will only can flex a bit, although she has a new knee. And, and this is like what the Bible is saying. You know, God will use, allow suffering, and it's suffering. You know, and that's where uh, it's hard to stay fit, right? You know, New Year's resolutions. I don't know how many of you make New Year's resolutions that you lose 20 pounds, 40 pounds, 50 pounds, and you know, that you do exercise and, and most people break the New Year's resolution within a week because it's not easy. It's not easy to go on the bike and cycle for half an hour and you're not going anywhere, still in the same spot, you know, because it's painful. But you know something that at the end of it, the muscles are built up. You're strengthening. Likewise, God allows the suffering in our life, the stress on our lives to grow our faith when we turn to Him. And suffering prepares us for the real thing, for the real work. Second Corinthians 4, 17 says, this momentary affliction or suffering is preparing you for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You know, when, when I was going through the military, when I was going through the early years where, where life was really difficult in every area, you know, everything was a struggle, but I knew God was preparing me. I never knew when He was preparing me what I would have to go through. I never knew back then that I would have to go through cancer surgery. I never knew back there that I have to go through so much trials in my life. And that's where God prepares us through the suffering. You know, before it comes, He begins to strengthen you, your faith, your muscles, because there's a great day coming for all of us, something bigger than what we have and who we are if we don't allow Him to prepare us. And then, of course, the second main point is that rebuilds are messy. Rebuilds are, are messy. And I pray that God will bless our mess. You know, some people say, well, it's a mess, it cannot be God. But God will allow us to mess up. But the way that God blesses your mess is that God will bless your mess with less. You know, God will bless your mess with less. And some of you are like, what are you talking about? Um, yesterday, Alina, uh, Alina put her house, her apartment on, on, on the market 
because God just spoke to her, yeah, it's time to move on. And so she had to prepare her apartment. And, uh, you know, it's interesting how in life you can move into a place and without you knowing, your house begins to clutter up so quickly. You know, so Pastor Art and uh, Sharon went there to, to prep the place, to take pictures, and, and I found out that they had to move a mountain from one spot to another spot so that they can take pictures of the house. But you know, all of us are like that. We clutter up so much in our lives um, that before you know it, we have this huge mess. And likewise, not just things in our life, but we have so many things that clutter up our lives. You know, the activities, you know, the, the, the financial burdens. Uh, the more we live, the more we want to enjoy life, the more burdens we take on and the more messy it is. And the way that God will bless us often is He takes away some of those things. You know, the simple life. Less is more blessed. And the reason why is that God uses the messiness of life to help us redefine or rediscover our priorities. Because the more things we carry in our life, the more things we have to juggle. The more things we, we, we ha that we carry as burdens, the less strength we have to focus on the things of God. Uh, and and that, that's what life does to us. And God, God has, you know, there's only a few things that are important. Paul says there's, in fact, only one thing, right? We sang the song, you know, one thing, right? Um, and Paul says there's only one thing, to know Him. You know, to know Him and the power. And, and you know, but the problem with life is that we, there's so many other things in life that we allow in. Worries, you know, the good life, and it clutters up our life. And so God wants to rebuild. And part of that, you have to clear the mess. You have to move away some of those things that clutter our lives so that we can be focused and we can prioritize God. And then, of course, by abandoning our God-given priorities, often we set ourselves up to learn a hard lesson. By abandoning God-given priorities, we set ourselves up for failure and messes in our life. You know, God always says, seek first the kingdom of God. And then all these things will follow. But we never learn. You know, we forget that He needs to be first. He says, worship me, love me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. But then we don't learn. We, we end up loving all these other things. And then those things come into our life. It becomes an idol. It becomes a problem in our life. It becomes such a burden. And then God has to remove some of those things. You know, it's like people that, you know, through the years I've worked with people on different things, even in our church and outside. And one of the things that is the greatest burden to people is debt today, financial debt. And we've had to work with people. Because let me say this, when you have such a great financial debt, debt in your life, you can't sleep, you can't eat properly, everything falls apart. Your marriage starts falling apart. You know, your future becomes uncertain. And people even come to a place where they think, I want to end my life. I don't want to continue on anymore because there seems to be no hope. The debt is so great, they don't see a way out. But there's always a way out because they've abandoned the priority of God. And so God withholds His blessing to His people till they rediscover His priorities. His priority is, are the principles in life. If He says, seek me first and all things will follow, He means it. It works. You make Him the God of your life, He'll take care of everything else. And so I challenge you on that. And God wants to turn our mess. He allows us to mess up because He knows that if we turn to Him, He'll turn our mess into a message for others. Our, our lives are like a movie for other people to watch as Christians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, If we are distressed, if we are under pressure, it is for your comfort and your salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. You know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying that my life is a testimonial for you to read. My life is a story of what works and what doesn't work. So that when you look at my life, if you see the stress, but you see the outcome, if you see the mess, and you see the message after that, you know what to do with your life. And it's important for us to allow God to take us through that. Because, let me say this, none of us are perfect. Every one of us has some kind of mess in our life. 
We have a messy background. You know, uh, every family has its own issues. Every marriage has its own issues. Every company has its own weak areas. And we mess up. But God allows that to happen so that we draw closer to Him. We depend on Him. And then when our lives get turned around, when we are blessed because of the mess that we created, then we turn to the Messiah, the one who saves us. Then there's a message for the world to see and look at our lives. Your mess and your messes prepare you to be the messenger with a message of grace. So God never wastes any pain, any suffering that we go through. Everything we go through will benefit someone else. You know, I, I am thankful I went through all the pain, all the suffering. But you know, through it, I know at least three people who are going through cancer treatment right now, they are blessed. I know you are blessed because you were there to pray with me and you saw how God delivered me. You saw how God blessed me through it. And so God never wastes any of your pain and suffering because other people are watching and they are learning and they're learning about God. They're learning about what God does in our pain and in our messes. And life will always be messy, but the message comes through clearer when there's a personal context. What do I mean by that? Life is messy, but the message comes through clearer when there's a personal context. You know, you talk to people about God. You can use theology and you say, oh, God is real. God created the world. But they need someone human to find that context, to be able to see a point of application in their life. And you are that person. You know, we can talk to people and tell them, oh, God is real. He does miracles. And, and, and pe people might be polite and they'll entertain you. Sure, sure, sure. You know, of course, you know, if there's God, you know, if there's a God, God can do miracles. But when I tell them about my life, and these people know me, it's personal. They know me. They know who I am. My neighbors know who I am for many years. People that I met, they know who I am. The nurses there, they know my situation because they got my whole medical file. They look at it, and when I tell them my story, that's a personal context there. I am real. I am like them. I am known to them. And when, when they know my story, then it becomes powerful. And so you are the person that is the po personal point of contact between God and them. You know, you can tell them about God, but they're looking at you. You can tell them about God's love, but they're looking at your love. You can talk about God's power, and you can talk about God's power to, to fix messes, but they look at you, right? And if they know you, and if you've been open with them about your life and honest, they'll know that, yeah, yeah, you're human, you have messes, you have problems, you have pain, you have suffering. And when they look at you and say, wow, God did that for you, I'm sure he can do it for me too. And that's where there's power in that. That's where, you know, uh, the message becomes powerful. And finally, rebuilds are time-consuming. It takes time. It takes time. Uh, last year, there was a fire in the business above us, our children's ministry, and the sprinklers went off. And so it flooded the children's ministry room. And the moment when that happened, we're like, oh man, this is going to take a long while to fix. Because you can't just take a wet bag and suck up the water or mop and, and, and mop it up and say, okay, we are ready to go. Because it's gone into the walls. It's gone into the ceiling. It's gone into the insulation. There's going to be more problem. So you have to fix. You have to remove the mold. You have to remove everything that's been contaminated, everything that has been wet and will invite the growth of that bacteria and mold and stuff. So you've got to remove those things. And that's why it's consuming. When God builds, God builds the foundations before the finishing. You can't just cover up something and pretend that there's no problems underneath it. In San Francisco Bay, there are a couple of buildings that are worth over a billion dollars. Very expensive buildings. If you drive by the area, there are famous buildings, very expensive. The most expensive is like 10 to 12 million dollars US. And a lot of people move into that building, but recently they found out that it's sinking. Because when they built the building, they didn't go deep enough to the bedrock. 
They put in foundations, but you only sat on the sand. And in San Francisco Bay, there's always movement. It's on the earthquake fault line. And so the sand has shifted. And so part of the building is tilting right now. And they don't know what to do. They don't know whether to knock the whole build the buildings down because it'll take billions to rebuild, to knock down and rebuild, or to start putting in pilings right to the bedrock and then re-dig into the foundation and rebuild it because they didn't get it right the first time. And that's the problem. You know, we are more concerned about the outside when God is more concerned about what's inside. You know, what is not seen is important with God. And so, uh, when God does a rebuild, He works us on the inside out. You know, when Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees, the number one problem with Pharisees is this, they were always good at the outside. He called them whitewashed sepulchres. In other words, you know, tombstones that were painted all nice and white. People go there, they say, wow, it looks so nice, so good. But you know what? It's death underneath. It's rotting bones and flesh underneath. And so God is saying, you know, when I build, I build from inside out. The process is critical to the final product. First, he starts with the gospel, the information. Then he moves. Information is, is not enough. It's not enough to just know. Then there's need, there needs to be transformation. He shares the gospel so that we can respond, so that we can be transformed, so that we can be born again, so that we can grow so that we can move to the third part, information to transformation of our lives, so that we can conform. So there's information, there's transformation, then there's conformation. We are conformed to the standards of Christ. You see, the Pharisees, what they did wrong was, they have information. They have the, the Torah, they have the five books of the, the, the Bible, and, and, and they have the law and everything else, and they want to move from information and say, God requires this, and so we need to conform without being transformed. That's the key, you see. They want to conform, so that's where everything is said. Oh, you cannot. Oh, you need to put on head, like what Iran is doing. Oh, you need to put on head where? Oh, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. If you do it, we will chop off your head, you know, chop off your hand. They try to make people to conform, but there's no transformation. And that's where it doesn't work. And likewise for us, when God rebuilds, He gives us the information through His Word. He says, this is what I require. This is what God wants for you. And then He gives you the power to be transformed. You know, Corinthians talks about it. From one degree of glory to another, He's changing us, the, the transformation, so that when you are transformed, then you can conform. If you're not transformed, you cannot conform. If a soldier is not trained, like Russia, you send them out there, how are they going to conform to the standards that are required of them? They can't run fast enough. They don't know what to do with their weapons. They don't know how to form up. They don't know the tactics. Like what's as Christians? You may know that you need to win a war, but if you have not been transformed, if you've not been trained, if you've not been prepared, you cannot do it. You cannot conform. And so God is taking us through that from the bottom up, from the foundation up, from the inside out. Too many folks are caught up with the furnishing more than the foundations. We are more interested in the outside. You need to finish your house before you furnish it. And this is where the problem comes because instant and Instagram Christians, I call them, they paint this picture of success stories, but they're skin deep, skin deep. You know, and that's where Instagram is a problem. Because young people, old people, they like to look at it and they're like, wow, this looks like a success story. I want to be with this person. But they, don't, they, they forget that behind it, deep in the heart, is a different story. And so they try to have that and they can't get it. So they become discouraged. They become depressed. Life is a journey where we are constantly learning the information. We are constantly growing, changing, so that we can be the person that God wants us. Sometimes breaking takes more time than building. You know, we want to be that giant. We want to look good. We want to be that building that is amazing. But sometimes God has to break some of the things out. There needs to be brokenness. And sometimes we refuse to be broken because we have pride. We feel like, I can do it myself. We feel like, I've built this up for myself and it's good enough. 
but God wants to break it down. And that's where there's pain, there's problems, there's suffering, because God needs to break down some of those objections, some of these walls that we built around us. And that's where God will bring us low. God will humble us. And I want to close with this. When we are brought low, let me say this often, that's when God is preparing you. Don't think that it's the end of the world. Oh, you know, I feel, I feel depressed. I want you to know that God is preparing you. Imagine Paul. He preached everywhere. He's so effective everywhere he goes. He leaves behind disciples and a new church. And then one day he prays because there's this thorn in his flesh. He doesn't tell us what it is, a sickness or, or whatever it is. He prays three times. He tells God, God, you know, I pray for people to get healed. I pray for churches they grow. I pray for people to become Christians. I, I have churches in Ephesus, in Philippi, in Corinth, everywhere. And I pray a prayer, a simple prayer, and you don't answer me. Three times. And God spoke to him in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. It's not an insult. Because God has a purpose for it. He says, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. My power is made perfect in your weakness. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardship, persecution, calamities. Why? For when I am weak, then I'm strong. We know this. We know this scripture. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. But we don't really know it. You know why? Because God wants to bring us low. And when you feel low and when you feel down, don't give up. Don't say, oh, you know, I also have depression. I've gone through it myself. And I realize it's God humbling me. It's God teaching me, you cannot do it alone. You've got to learn to depend on me more. That's one. But the next thing is this. I found this, that when I'm at my weakest, that's where when I was going through my chemo, Many of you saw me when I was going through the chemo, when the doctor said, don't leave your house. I wasn't supposed to leave my house. When you're going through the chemo, stay at home, rest. Don't go back to work. My family doctor said, just fill up this form, I'll give you handicap parking. Seriously, I mean, that's part of it. I didn't want to do it because I said, God, I'm not handicapped. I said, God, you may allow me to come this way, but I want to know your grace. Doctor say, I'm going to fill up this form so that you can go on disability and you don't need to work anymore. I said, no, God called me to work. He'll give me grace. And during that period of my chemo, you were there, you know. I did so much stuff. I never stopped. I went faster. I even did, you know, started Leadership 401. I started working with different things, different ones, preparing different ones because I was brought low by sickness. I'm like you, human. At that point, you know, you know, I never heard a clear word from God. I'm going to heal you. God just told me, go through the process, and my grace will be with you. So I went through the process. You know, there are moments where I lie there in bed. Before I go to bed every night, I say, Jesus, are you coming tonight to heal me? And at the back of my mind, I know, if he doesn't come, I'll probably be dead six months to a year. I'll be dead because it's already spread, the cancer. And I knew that. So I was low. I was late low. But you know, that's when I found the greatest strength, the greatest joy. Every morning I woke up, I had such a joy. I could get on my bicycle and go on it. I could ride. I could rollerblade. I could do the ministry. I could call up different ones. I wasn't behaving like a cancer patient preparing to die. I was behaving like a person that was planning for life because of the grace of God. I want to close with this question. I was just thinking about this. The Spirit of God just dropped it in my heart. Could it be that God is delaying your breakthrough because you are not weak enough to receive it? You probably have never heard this question posed to you before. Could it be? Because we're not weak enough to receive it. Maybe because we are too proud. Maybe because we're too strong in ourselves and say, no, I can do it. 
You know, I've done it. I've, I've, I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. I've taken care of my family. I can do it. But maybe God is doing like what he did with Paul. He says, I'm not going to answer your prayer. You're going to continue to have your sickness. You're going to continue to have the thorn in the flesh. But I'm going to show you that when you are weakest, when you are low, I will do the greatest miracles. God did that in my life. My grace is sufficient for you. And that's why this morning, perhaps you need to just allow God to break some of those things away that you're holding on. And say, God, I won't hold on to all these things. I won't hold on to all my crutches in life, all the idols, all the good stuff. I'm just going to let go. Because without you, without you, I can't do it. Let me pray for you this, mo this, this morning. Father, you are good, and you have good plans for us. Lord, you saved us, and you are building us. You said, I will build my church, meaning each one of us. So, Lord, I pray that you build right now. Build, oh God, strong foundations in each one of those that are sitting here. Lord, I pray that you will break whatever needs to be broken. Remove whatever rubble that needs to be removed so that you can build us strong, oh God. Lord, I pray that if you have to bring us low, oh God, to teach us what the strength of the Lord is, Lord, do it in our lives. Lord, because we love you, because we trust you, because we know that you are good. And so, Lord, I pray this morning, do the special work in lives, oh God. Lord, I pray that you give a breakthrough, oh God. Breakthrough in every life, oh God. Whatever needs they have in their life, let there be a breakthrough this week, oh God. Let them know you in the power of weakness, oh God. The power of God be made manifest in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.